So thank you everybody for attending and thank you for hosting me. Um, I can hear my voice echoing, so I assume it's carrying pretty well. Uh, so as Tony said, I'll be talking about sepsis recognition in the NICU and our efforts to uh, both um, understand the impacts of sepsis delays and um, try to predict sepsis earlier. So disclosures, formalities, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, so as I said, I'll talk about um, our study on looking at the impact of delays in time to treatment for sepsis in the NICU. Um, then I'll talk about our efforts to develop machine learning models uh, to recognize sepsis earlier, specifically in the NICU. And then finally, I'll talk about uh, the limitations and challenges that ICU settings uh, present, uh, which are a little bit different than perhaps other settings, and how that affects our efforts with uh, machine learning prediction uh, models. So let's get started first with trying to understand um, what happens with delayed treatment. And so for those of you who may not know, I, I expect most of you probably do, but sepsis is essentially uh, an over-response by the body's immune system to infection. Uh, it can result when the body starts attacking its own cells effectively, uh, which can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and potentially death. Um, the impact for infants is particularly high. The mortality rate for sepsis acquired, uh, sorry, NICU acquired sepsis is upwards of 30%, depending on what study you look at. So uh, a fairly catastrophic uh, potential event. Um, for even for those who survive, um, 30 to 50% of the survivors include, uh, incur long-term impairments uh, that are pretty significant. These can be cardiopulmonary impairments, for example. Uh, so a pretty, pretty serious uh, condition. Um, at the same time, it presents in heterogeneous ways. The, the clinical presentation can be subtle, and so that delays uh, clinical recognition. And so one of our first question is, well, what is the impact of that delay or delays to antibiotic treatment? So we set out to uh, conduct a study wherein uh, our goal was to determine whether or not there were associations uh, between time to antibiotic administration and particular sepsis outcomes. Uh, we conducted, this is a study conducted here at CHOP, um, perspective analysis of all infants who received uh, at least one sepsis evaluation in the CHOP NICU during the study period. Uh, this resulted in approximately 2,000 evaluations for nearly 1,000 infants. Uh, however, uh, we only considered evaluations in our analysis for, that were positive for bacterial infection. So again, we're looking at uh, the impact of delays in antibiotic treatment, so other sources of, or potential causes of sepsis such as viral or, or fungal infection would not be responsive to antibiotics, so they're not included in our study. This gives us 128 evaluations for uh, a little over 100 infants, 113. Um, and so to be clear, what we mean by, in our study at least, time to antibiotic treatment, we look at the time delay between either the clinician order for blood culture as part of the sepsis evaluation and the time to antibiotic administration, so that's the bottom left, uh, or the time between the antibiotic order and the time to antibiotic administration, whichever was longer. So the, uh, the blood culture order and the antibiotic order don't necessarily happen concurrently. Um, so what did we find? Well, in our cohort, uh, first of all, there was 32% um, mortality rate, so again, a very serious condition. Um, we also found statistically significant um, relationships between the time to antibiotic um, administration and uh, negative outcomes. So specifically, we looked at time to antibiotic administration as a continuous variable in 30-minute increments, uh, and we found that uh, for every 30-minute uh, increment in that time, uh, there's a roughly 1.5-fold increase in both 14-day and 30-day mortality rates. So uh, obviously a statistically significant um, association. So obviously the delay in antibiotic treatment is uh, very important. Um, we also found a, uh, so a negative association with inotrope free days. So inotropic medications are used to affect the um, forcefulness of cardiovascular contractions. So in this case, we, we don't want to be using these medications, uh, but there was essentially um, 
a statistically significant increase in the number of days on which infants who had experienced uh, a sepsis evaluation were on these medications for every 30 minute delay in antibiotic treatment after recognition. Another way to look at that data is um, the increase in probability of mortality within 14 days. So what we're looking at here on the x-axis is the time to antibiotics after clinical recognition. Uh, and on the y-axis, the probability of mortality within 14 days. And so the four solid dots are at 30 minutes, 90 minutes, uh, two hours, um, and, and uh, 210 minutes. And so what we see is that there's an increase, a very rapid increase from something less than 10% probability of mortality uh, at 30 minutes delay up to almost a little over 40% probability um, for at the, at the far end. So again, critical that antibiotics are administered as quickly as possible um, after recognition of sepsis in the NICU. So this is the first study actually to look at uh, infants specifically. Other studies in adults um, and older kids uh, have kind of have revealed the same sorts of conclusions. So, you know, that lays what I think is, you know, the groundwork for why we care about recognizing sepsis earlier. The question becomes, uh, how can we do it in the NICU? Uh, so we've taken a machine learning approach, and so we're looking at machine learning models for early recognition of sepsis. But before I dive into what we did and what our results are, uh, just to kind of give everybody a um, framework for what is machine learning, I don't think everybody is familiar with it, uh, I'm going to give a two-slide introduction to supervised machine learning, which will tell you everything you need to know about going out and implementing machine learning models. Well, okay, probably not, but hopefully at least gives you a grounding of the concepts. So what we start off with is we assume there's some functional relationship between our input variables, so data about the patient in this case, so what we're calling X here, and an output that we care about, Y in this example, but sepsis uh, is what we care about and that that function is parameterized by some unknown values theta. And we need to learn what those theta values are. So that's what we care about in the machine learning process. So how do we get there? Well, we start with, in a supervised context, we start with a bunch of training data where we know both the inputs x and the outputs y. We go through a learning process where in the first step is we generate, uh, well, we randomly initialize these theta parameters we generate predictions, uh, these y hat variable, and then we ask how close those, current, those predictions are to the known variable. So we have this training objective function, uh, which com is composed of two parts. Uh, the first is called a loss term, and so basically there we're just looking at how accurate our predictions uh, are relative to the known answers in that training data. And then we also have what's called a regularization term. Basically, this enforces certain characteristics that we might care about on these theta parameters that we're trying to learn. For instance, we don't want them to get too large, so we don't want any one input feature to dominate the rest of the features. Uh, or maybe we want some, many of those features to be, the, these theta values to be close to zero, meaning that if we're trying to incorporate a large number of features, we want to maybe keep this model, model sparse so that some of the features essentially have no impact on the model predictions. So we do that. We look at the, the current value of this loss and regularization terms, and we ask whether or not we need to update these theta parameters based on some criteria. If we do, we have an optimization routine, which uh, generates the up current update to these theta values. We then go through that whole process again until finally we decide that we don't need to update these parameters anymore, at which point we evaluate uh, the resulting model on a held out test data set, again, looks like, just looks like the training data in the sense that it has uh, input variables with known output variables, but most importantly, uh, this data set is never used in the training process, so the model's never seen this before. So there's a lot of things that you could do with a supervised machine learning model. What we're going to care about in, in this work is uh, machine learning classification. So the goal here is uh, given a set of inputs, we want to learn a boundary that separates different classes uh, within those inputs. So in our case, it would be sepsis versus non-sepsis. So that boundary could be linear, uh, as in this model. 
But of course, you can also have nonlinear data that's a nonlinear boundary, like in this model. Um, and depending on the kind of data you have and perhaps how you think this data might be separated based on your input variables will play a significant role in the types of models you might uh, train. Some models are not capable of learning nonlinear boundaries. Um, so, and of course, with any, as with any model, um, you're going to, no matter how well it's trained, and no matter how much data you have, you're going to ultimately end up with misclassified examples. And that's essentially what we're going to look at to determine how well our models perform. So I'll come back to that notion later. Okay, so with that context in mind, what we were setting out to do is to find a machine learning, object, a machine learning model that could perform this classification function by basically saying, okay, I'm going to give the model um, a collection of data representing the patient for some period of time and ask whether or not that data represents a, a case of sepsis or not. So with that in mind, our first step, uh, well, and our goal is that we want to be able to identify sepsis four hours earlier than clinicians currently recognize sepsis, right? So uh, in that first analysis, we found that just a few hours in time to antibiotic treatment makes a significant difference. So if we could just back up that recognition by a few hours, perhaps we could significantly lower mortality rates. So the first step becomes, well, what is uh, current clinical recognition, right? At what point in what do we mean by that? Uh, if I'm going to frame a machine learning problem, I need to define that first. So we marked it in alignment with the first study as the point in time at which a blood culture is ordered or the point in time in which the antibiotics are, uh, are ordered, uh, whichever comes first. The next step is to decide uh, what data and how much data to use in the input model. And so since what we care about um, in our case, is predicting sepsis four hours prior to this clinical recognition. We know we need to back up from that recognition point to four hours earlier, so any data we're going to use in our model has to be data that was generated at least four hours prior to that point. Um, great. And then the question becomes how far back into the past we would want to consider data into this input model. So there haven't been any studies that indicate sort of what the gestation period time is in infants to know uh, from the time of, say, initial infection to the time where that might present into clinical symptoms. Uh, how long does that take? We don't really know the answer to that. But we do know that in blood cultures, an incubation time of 48 hours is enough to generate positive results if there is an infection. So we made the assumption that 40, moving back to 48 hours seems like uh, there's plausible clinical indicators in, in our data, uh, but moving to data older than that probably wouldn't provide any signal. So we're going to take a 44-hour window, um, which goes back 48 hours from the time of, of the clinical recognition, as the window of data that we're going to input into the model. And so with that in mind, we're defining a sepsis, oh, sorry, an episode in this study as any 44-hour period during a NICU hospitalization. And what we want to do is to be able to say, okay, if I take 44-hour window of data for a patient and I put it into this model, I want it to tell me yes or no that this patient has sepsis. So to generate training data, right, so we need to train our, this is a supervised model, so we need to be able to train it. So we need data where we know uh, the inputs and we know the outputs. So for case data, right, instances uh, that are positive for sepsis, that's fairly easy for us to do. We go back into our, uh, we have a NICU sepsis registry. We go into that registry and we take all uh, sepsis evaluations uh, in, the, in the study period, which is about three years, and we look for the ones that either had a positive blood culture or the ones that were negative, uh, negative blood culture, uh, but antibiotic treatment was administered for at least five days. So. Uh, the blood culture for bacterial infection uh, can, has a high false negative rate, so often clinicians will treat if they really believe that sepsis is present for longer than five days. Uh, so we consider both of those events to be sepsis positive events. Uh, and then we just take the window of data that's in that 44 hour window that starts four hours before the blood culture uh, as our case data. Now we have 375 of those in our study period. Uh, what gets a little bit trickier is figuring out what to use as control data, right? So the, the windows of data that we're going to give the model and training that are negative for sepsis. Uh, so we took the same set of patients and 
We looked for periods of time in their hospitalization in the NICU where there was no evidence for sepsis for these individuals. And we defined that basically as any point in time at which the, that was removed from a, any sepsis evaluation for at least 10 days. So that's the shaded regions in this uh, bottom figure. Um, so no sepsis evaluations and no antibiotic administration during, um, the, during uh, the 10 days on either side of these windows and of course during the windows themselves. We then s randomly selected 1,100 points in time from all of those possible windows and took 44 hours of data for each one of those randomly selected points. So why 1,100? Well, that gives us a 25% prevalence rate uh, of sepsis, right? So the 375 divided by 1475 is approximately 25%. And that matches the prevalence rate if you look at all of the sepsis evaluations during the uh, period of time of this study to, and, and you look at the number that the 375 that are um, uh, positive blood cultures or clinically septic, meaning they were treated with antibiotics for one hundred five days, uh, you have the same prevalence rate. Um, and so that's a, an important point that I'll, I'll come back to later when I talk about challenges in the ICU because that may not necessarily be realistic depending on how you choose to deploy uh, an AI or machine learning based system uh, that might be always on. So, okay, the next step in developing a machine learning model is you have to identify the features that you want to use in the model. Also, uh, in partnership with uh, several clinicians, we identified 36 uh, features from the electronic health record that could be used to plausibly predict sepsis. So I'll note that we specifically wanted features that were readily uh, extractable from uh, the electronic health record so that um, with the intent that other institutions could more or less easily adopt this kind of model if it worked. Uh, so again, we're, we're not looking currently in this work um, at say something like streaming vital signs or genomic data. We wanted to rely ex explicitly on features that were relatively easy to get out of the EHR. So these are things like uh, clinical assessments, um, the use of respiratory support, presence of central lines, some vit uh, hourly vital sign measurements as recorded in the EHR and laboratory tests. Now. With respect to the laboratory tests, we have to be very careful here. So almost um, all of our controls have, did not have most of the lab values during the control window that we cared about, right? So during those control windows, uh, more than 60% uh, of the lab values, uh, uh, sorry, more, all of the lab values were missing more than 60% of the time uh, for, throughout those control windows, whereas during the cases, uh, it was you know, much less than that. So without going into too much detail, um, what that means is that you can't really apply missing data imputation methods because these lab values are not miss what's called missing completely at random. Basically, you, what, what happens is the lab values for the cases are ordered because the clinicians suspect that something is wrong. So if we tried to do imputation, we would sort of have a biased result uh, in doing that. So rather than use the lab values themselves, we treated these as indicator variables, meaning, for example, white blood cell count, uh, we don't include the actual count value. We simply include a yes or no that this feature, that this laboratory value was ordered at this, during this window of time. Um, and so that becomes essentially a proxy for clinical suspicion, but not the, the count itself. Um, and that's true of all of of the lab values included in the model. Uh, and so I, this will be an important point that I'll come back to again later in terms of trying to improve these models. So, okay, so with all those caveats in place and the setup in place, how well does the model perform? Well, here we're looking at uh, the receiver operating characteristic curve for one particular model. We considered several, uh, but something called the XG boost model uh, was the best. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail about that other than to say XGBoost is a tree-based model, so decision tree-based model uh, that incorporates um, many trees. Uh, they're sort of very small trees that get combined to make a single prediction. Um, and what we find is that uh, we looked uh, at 10 validation folds and what we find is that um, the, so we're looking at three different ROC curves here. The the solid line is the curve for 
the median area under the curve. So higher area under the curve is better. The maximum is one. Uh, the other two represent um, the maximum and minimum uh, curves for, for the values with the maximum and minimum area under the curve across those 10 validation folds. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with receiver operating characteristic curves or ROC curves, uh, basically it, it off plays the sensitivity of the model and the specificity of the model. And ideally what you want is uh, a curve that uh, sort of rapidly rises to that top left corner and gives you an area of one under the curve, meaning that you essentially have perfect sensitivity and perfect specificity. Naturally, that doesn't happen in practice. Uh, getting a res median result of 80 plus percent is pretty good for this, for this kind of problem. Um, and perhaps more importantly, the fact that the minimum and maximum over these validation folds are relatively close to each other suggests that the model is not sort of wildly variant depending on you know, the, the sample of data you happen to give it. Um, to put that into sort of fixed terms a little bit, uh, if we select a decision threshold such that we get 80% uh, sensitivity, meaning we'll recognize 80% of the sepsis positive cases, then we end up with 72% specificity for the, for the median curve and it's, and it's pretty close across the other validation curves. Uh, likewise, we can look at something called the precision versus uh, sensitivity, or precision is the same as positive predictive value, um, precision versus sensitivity curve. And again, we care about the sort of area under the curve or something called the me median, uh, the average precision or average uh, positive predictive value. And so here the median's about 67%. We have the same set of three curves um, relative to the, the validation folds. And again, fixing, um, we like to kind of look sometimes at point metrics, fixing at an 80% sensitivity, we get uh, just over 50% positive predictive value. That's actually very good, compare, at least as compared to other models attempting to do the same thing. It could be very good uh, in reality, in clinical practice, depending on your deployment setting. Um, so for a single, if you're only doing one evaluation for a patient and that's all you're ever going to do, this maybe isn't so bad. Um, but as, well, as I'll talk about, when you get into ICU settings where you're doing multiple evaluations for a patient over time, this starts to represent a significant challenge. So another way to look at the performance of the model is something called learning curves. So um, my purpose for presenting this is really to give you a little bit more background on how you analyze machine learning models. Uh, maybe not so much a concern about uh, our model specifically, but I know, um, you know there's obviously a lot of interest now in using machine learning models and there's a lot of publications. And a lot of times there's analysis that's left out that probably should be included. And one of that, uh, I believe, is uh, learning curve analysis. And so what this shows us, we're comparing a lot of things in this uh, that I'll walk through that uh, really inform you about uh, what happened in training the model and how well the model uh, is actually doing. So what this presents is on the x-axis, we're looking at the number of training samples used to train the model, right? So back in that supervised learning slide, I said that I had a set of data where I knew both the inputs and the outputs. And so the question here is uh, on that x-axis is how large is that set? And on the y-axis, I have some performance metric. Um, in this case, we don't really care what it is. Uh, other than to say that one is the optimal value for this particular performance metric. And so the two curves, the top curve is the model performance on the training data itself. So I train the model, let's say with 400 inputs, and then I ask the model to, act, to go and label those training set samples. It doesn't do perfectly, but it, um, we evaluate its performance. And at the same time, I ask the model to evaluate, uh, to give me predictions for the validation set. This is the bottom curve. And so there's some things, there's several things that we would like to have happen, um, but they don't. So the first thing is that ideally the training score, well, both scores should go to one. When the training set does, uh, the score on the training set does not go to one, that suggests that there may be bias in the model. Now, um, I hesitate to use the words bias and variance in front of an audience that maybe thinks more in terms of uh, standard statistical terms. Bias here in a machine learning context uh, means that either the model itself does not have the capacity to learn the decision boundary um, because the decision boundary is too complex. So for instance, if the decision boundary is nonlinear and I use a linear model, there's no way 
that no matter how much data I give that, that model or how many features I give that model, it's not going to be able to learn a nonlinear boundary because it can only create linear boundaries. Likewise, uh, I don't think that's what's happening here because the XGBoost model can learn quite complicated boundaries. But the other issue can be that if the data itself simply doesn't contain the signal necessary to differentiate the classes of interest, which is what I suspect is going on in our case, right? So the reason we don't achieve uh, perfect performance in this is because the features we're using simply don't contain enough signal to, differ to perfectly differentiate sepsis and non-sepsis cases. So that's effective, simply a limitation of the model. The other issue that, can, that creeps in is when these two curves don't reach the same asymptote, meaning they don't, as you add uh, training, set, uh, training samples, if they don't approach the same performance value, uh, it suggests that your model um, has some variance, um, also known as overfitting. Uh, and so in this case, we, we definitely have some of that. It's, it's not horrible as compared to uh, what can happen. Uh, but it does suggest that if we had more training samples, we might expect that the model uh, would perform better. So again, these are just things that you can take away, a lot of things that you can take away from, from one plot um, and that really should be part of uh, any machine learning analysis. So, okay, I've, so that's our, our work to date using uh, information that's, you know, sort of easily accessible, quote unquote, from the electronic health record. Um, and, you know, it does pretty well for, for what we were set out to do, but there's definitely limitations and challenges that are particularly part of an ICU setting um, that we probably really still need to adapt to. And so, you know, what's different about the ICU than maybe perhaps other settings, right? So, in, in the real answer to me, aside from perhaps the clinical status of the, of the children in them, um, but in terms of the nature of the environment itself is, uh, with respect to data, is that there's continuous monitoring over time, right? So I'm not making a single evaluation. And so that raises uh, some particular challenges. So there was a very nice paper uh, that was done called What Clinicians Want, wherein they, uh, with respect to machine learning and explain, explanations of machine learning predictions, uh, and what the authors did was they conducted a survey of both uh, emergency department physicians and ICU physicians and they presented them hypothetical scenarios wherein they were provided the output of uh, a machine learning model and asked um, if you ha what additional information do you need in order to utilize this machine learning uh, predict this, pr any, well it doesn't have to be machine learning, it could be any predictive model, um, but to utilize this, the, the output of this model. And so the first thing, the most important thing was that um, particularly in the ICU, Physicians wanted explanations of the features that the model felt were important for this particular prediction, right? So not, the, not features that the model thinks is important across the entire population, uh, but rather for this particular uh, input, this particular patient, what are the features that matter? The other thing that they wanted in the ICU setting was uh, that those features really need to be ones that align with changes in clinical status. And so, that really eliminates uh, many known risk factors. So you can imagine, for example, in an emergency department, if I tell you that the reason I think that this individual is at risk for sepsis is because of their age and perhaps their sex, then that may be valuable for a one-time evaluation in the ED. But if I tell you that a patient who's been in the ICU for 10 days and who wasn't, I didn't think was at risk for sepsis in the past, and now I think they are, well, telling you the, their age is useless to you as a clinician, right? You've already incorporated that into your thinking. You already know that's a risk factor. So if I'm going to update my prediction, I need to do it dependent on features that suggest some change in clinical status. So that's one challenge. Uh, the other challenge is that I think we think about these machine learning models or the potential of these machine learning or AI models as something which is always on, running in the background, and providing predictions sort of on demand. Um, but the reality is that um, not much is necessarily changing uh, with respect to the data, or even if there are things that are changing, it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the model uh, should is adapting to them very well. And, I, and this can lead to high false alarm rates, right? Because if the prior probability 
say, for, let's just focus on sepsis, if the prior probability of sepsis is low, well, then running a diagnostic model that, even, that has even a pretty high PPV, one that's even much higher than, say, 50%, is still going to lead to a lot of false positives, right? This is sort of statistics 101, right? You know, you see this all the time, a, a diagnostic test that has a 99% specificity of PPV. Uh, if your prior probability of a particular infection is less than 1%, well, randomly applying that is still going to give you a very large number of false positives. And so... Uh, an always-on model in the ICU, depending on, especially on how frequently it is updated, right, you could imagine that if it's, say, dependent on vital signs, this thing could be spitting out predictions, you know, every few seconds. Well, in that kind of scenario, if your prior probability of infection hasn't changed, well, then even with a high, uh, highly performing model, you're still going to have a lot of false alarms. And so that's something that, moving forward, we're going to have to address. And unfortunately, spoiler alert, we, we're not addressing it today. Um, but I'm, I want to talk about how we're sort of trying to address these two things. So the first one is around this feature importance question, right? So we want to be able to provide clinicians who might be using these models explanations that uh, uh, indicate which features were important. And again, I want to differentiate uh, between global explanations and uh, local explanations. So a global explanation is one that is independent, if you will, of the current input. Um, so you can imagine in this little sort of cartoon of data here where we have two classes and we've got a model, a decision boundary based on two features, that the global explanation would say both features, x1 and x2, are important in order to make predictions. But a local explanation uh, is dependent on the current input sample. And there, we might find that things are a little bit different. So if I look at this particular point, in this local explanation, X1 is more important, right? If you just kind of look at a fixed level of X2, kind of on a horizontal line, um, the prediction changes rapidly dependent on the value of X1. However, in this region, looking at this particular example, the opposite is true. So here, X2 is much more important because, again, now if I look at a fixed vertical sort of area, um, the... the uh, prediction changes rapidly depending on, on very different, uh, sorry, rapidly with respect to X2, but X1 is not that important here. So that's the, the, the difference between this, these local explanations and, these, and a global explanation. And so we want to focus on local explanations. Um, and so the problem becomes how to do that with very complicated models, right? So simpler models, um, simple decision trees or maybe linear models or something like that. You might be able to look at this model and just sort of interpret it on your own, but very complex models such as XGBoost, that's not really feasible. And so uh, one of the ways that we can try to get at that is using something called post hoc interpretations. And so in that scenario, we start with a complex model. We then add an interpreter. So this is another method that will analyze either the model itself or predictions from the model, and what it will do is provide some sort of explanation or interpretation of either the model or the predictions that can come in many different forms. It could be the presentation of, of examples or patients in our case that are similar to the input uh, that we're currently looking at. It could be visualizations about the sort of internal workings of the model, or for what we care about, it could be the features that were important for this particular prediction. And then, of course, those are provided to the user who can then try to understand you know, what's, what's happening with this prediction. And so the, um, what we care about is feature importance for individual predictions. And what we're going to use is a uh, something that's called additive feature attribution. And so what we're doing here is we take our global model, which predicts um, classes based on a boundary, that, a decision boundary that it's learned. And we want to know something about this particular input here. And what we're going to do is form essentially a local approximation to the global model that, ha uh, that tells that it's a linear local approximation. And so this looks, of course, very familiar, I'm sure. It's a logist sim essentially a simple logistic regression. And we can interpret the fee, if we can form this model, we can interpret these values, these weighting parameters as being uh, measures of the importance of the individual features X1 and X2 with respect to this particular uh, input. Uh, and so there's certain characteristics that we want this approximation to have. 
Uh, first of all, it, one is that it should be um, faithful to the original model in the set for this particular prediction, meaning that uh, if F said, if this complex model F said that this patient has sepsis, then this local approximation model should also say that this patient has sepsis. Uh, another characteristic that we care about is something called consistency, meaning that um, if I take two models, uh, two complex models, and one model always thinks that a particular feature is more important um, than the other model, then the local approximation should also always think that that feature is more important. Um, so it turns out that there is actually only, well, we can extend this, first of all, and I'm not going to bore you with too much of the mathematics here, but what we're going to particularly care about is a method called Shapley additive explanations. Um, this is an extension of what I just uh, described um, conceptually into a uh, theoretical grounded approach uh, that extends to a higher uh, number of dimensions for, on the input. And so basically, we have the same, let's not worry about that, but um, we have the same sort of setup where we're trying to develop a local approximation. Again, this is for a particular input uh, that has a linear form. Um, and, what we, and we want it to have the characteristics that I talked about as far as uh, matching the complex model and this consistency. And it turns out there's only one version of those uh, phi values uh, that actually maintains those characteristics that we care about. They're derived from gain theory. Certainly not going to go into that, but um, I do want to just show the ugliness of the equation. But, so you have, for every one of the input features in your model, you want a weighting value, which is this phi on the far left. And to calculate that, you have to use this awful equation on the far right. I won't go into that too much, other than to just say that the left-hand side is a weighting term uh, that looks at sort of the number of different subsets of features that you could use. Um, and the right-hand side is just a difference in the model output when you include the ith feature, so the feature that you care about at the moment, uh, versus when you don't include that. Um, and without going into all the gory details, there's a whole lot of assumptions that have to go into making these computations, uh, making computation of those values feasible. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the, the approach we're going to use. And what I care about more is applying this to our sepsis uh, data and trying to understand what our model is doing in making predictions. And importantly, is it relying on value, values that change uh, with clinical status, uh, or is it relying on sort of known indicator, uh, known risk factors that are somewhat static? And so what we're looking at here um, is on a, a plot of uh, the feature importance as computed by this uh, SHAP method for all 1,400 plus examples in our data set. So every one of these dots on this plot corresponds to a particular sample from our uh, data set. And along the vertical, what we have is the top 20 most important features according to this method out of the 36 that were included in our model. Don't worry about not being able to read the vertical axis. I'm going to walk through that. Um, though the x-axis uh, centered at zero is the SHAP importance weight that uh, each feature has for each one of uh, these particular samples. So for a dot that is, say, to the far left uh, on that x-axis, that means that the SHAP weight was very negative, which suggests that for that particular feature, for that particular value, that sample, that feature was... Um, pushing the model towards predicting not sepsis. At the same time, values to the far right of center uh, are ones that the model is saying for that particular sample and that particular feature value, um, that was pushing the model to predict sepsis. And uh, the coloring basically me just means that the feature value was either for blue means that it was lower than uh, the mean across the population, and red means that it was high relative to the mean of the population. Uh, I should point out that a lot of these are, are binary values, so blue simply means that the, the observation was not present, and red would mean the observation is present, but for the things like age, it's a continuum. Um, and so, you know, what do we find? Well, somewhat discouragingly, what we find is that the top three features that the model is relying on, presence of a central venous line, age of the patient, 
and uh, whether or not the patient is on uh, respiratory support, mechanical ventilation, um, are the features that were most important to the model um, and that the weights were sort of, for the most part, lar much larger than the rest. So as I mentioned a couple of times now, you know, these are kind of, you know, essentially either quasi-static features or things that aren't changing rapidly with respect to the, the time uh, that the patient's in the ICU. And there's certainly features that clinicians kind of you know, already know are risk factors for sepsis. Um, so that's, that's you know, something to take away from that. So then the next sort of set of features that we care about is a number of lab indicators. Well, those certainly change with changes in clinical status. But again, where you have to be careful with interpreting machine learning models is if, if you recall, I said that we didn't use the values themselves. We treated these as indicator values, meaning that either the lab was observed or not. So as far as the machine learning model is concerned, this doesn't really mean, doesn't necessarily correlate, rather, with a change in clinical status. What it really is is a proxy for clinical, clinician suspicion. And so if I tell a clinician, well, the reason the model thinks that this patient has sepsis is because you ordered uh, you know, a blood workup, well, again, that's not terribly informative uh, in an ICU setting, right? Um, so where we have some potential value here is the remaining important features, of which there are a number, are all are primarily related to vital sign data. So we use vital sign data uh, from the, last, the most recent hour um, and differences over the 44-hour period uh, as inputs into our model. And so certainly the, the most important features include a number of things related to vital signs, as well as some related to, to clinical observations. Um, so that suggests that we could, pro we could use that information uh, probably to boost, A, boost the performance of our models, but B, uh, try to develop models that are more reliant on these pieces of information that reflect changes in clinical status and that are hopefully more informative to individuals working in the, uh, trying to assess sepsis in the ICU. So that's where we're moving toward now is uh, moving away from just using static, uh, or I'm sorry, not static, just using uh, values extracted from the EHR and moving on to looking at streaming vital signs. So one of the advantages in the ICU is that we have bedside monitors. They're measuring uh, vital signs on a second-to-second -second basis. Uh, and so if we can incorporate that information, perhaps um, you know, we can develop better models that are more informative. We know, for instance, that decreases in heart rate variability are associated with sepsis. Um, in fact, they're associated with a number of, of adverse outcomes, but sepsis being one of them. So if we can uh, recognize anomalous patterns um, in this streaming vital sign data, then perhaps we can uh, develop models that correlate with changes in clinical status and provide clinicians with information that goes beyond just the known risk factors. Uh, so, right, right, so we want to incorporate these into our models, again, to develop models that are aligned with changes in clinical status and hopefully to improve the precision of the models and potentially reduce false alarms. So where are we with this work? It's very early days. Um, here at CHOP, we are fortunate. Uh, the last couple of years, um, we have started storing for retrospective analysis every vital sign measurement that comes off of a bedside monitor uh, throughout the hospital. Um, and so we are starting to work with that data. First, we need to understand the data quality. Um, but before we leap to working with the real data, what we are currently doing is looking at simulated data. So here what we've done um, is generate uh, 10,000 patients uh, with 500 samples of heart rate uh, per patient. The, um, these are zero mean, uh, but the variance is based on values that we observe in actual heart rate data. So the, the, um, yeah, the variability in the data is roughly equivalent to what we might expect in, in uh, actual data. Um, and what we are doing sort of very artificially and making the initial problem very simple is for the controls, we don't do anything. We just sample 500 randomly sampled heart rate values, uh, simulated heart rate values. And then for the cases, we'll select a block of 100 uh, heart rates where we slam the, the variability down uh, very to, 
you know, to one instead of 10. Um, and that is designed to sort of mimic this decrease in heart rate variability that we know exists uh, prior to adverse events, I mean, based on published literature. And so we want to see if we can just, you know, if we can develop models that can even detect that signal. Because if we can't do that, then there's not a whole lot of purpose into jumping into real data. So the good news is uh, we developed a, a very simple, conv what's called a convolutional neural network model. Let's not worry about that. It's a form of deep learning uh, that is able to take this window of data, process it, uh, it runs it through, um, a, well, a eight kernels uh, that basically perform local regressions on the data and look for patterns that are predictive of whether or not the input is a case or a control, and that we find on a simulated, again, a simulated data set that this model gets to 93% test accuracy. So that's at least encouraging that uh, we can develop models that could look at this kind of streaming vital sign data and generate predictions that are both you know, more precise and uh, informative uh, to clinicians relative to changes in clinical status. So I hope that in a year from now, I'll be able to present again and tell you that we've actually done this in real data uh, and that the results are promising. And so with uh, the conclusion, right, so obviously longer time to antibiotics, um, and delays in sepsis treatment can result in significant uh, negative outcomes. Machine learning models may be useful, but the ICU does present uh, stricter requirements and challenges. So with that in mind, I certainly want to acknowledge my many collaborators and thank you everybody for attending.